coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Where is the goodness of God? We need the goodness of God back in America. And when the, the goodness of God comes back on America, we're going to start seeing things change. Matter of fact, we're going to start seeing people change. We're going to see their attitudes and their works and, and every, their, everything that they do change because the goodness of God leads us to change. Give Him praise. Isn't God good? I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for tuning in to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery. Today we're bringing you a brand new prophetic word. The Lord had just dropped this in my spirit, and it was so explosive here at War Harvest North when I shared it. I felt by the Holy Spirit that we needed to get it out more quickly than we have in the past with other messages because it's so relevant to the very hour that we're living in. It's entitled Times and Seasons. This will truly bless your heart. It comes from God's Word. Get the Word out. Go with me, and let's hear what the Spirit has to say. Today, the Lord has given me a message that's entitled, Times and Seasons. It is a prophetic declaration to the church in America and to this nation. As I get ready to begin, I want to share a scripture out of 2 Chronicles 20:20. 20, 20. Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. There are things that the Lord has revealed to me in prayer through this fast that God is wanting to do in this nation. And so we're going to lay a foundation, and toward the end of this message, God will bring out what he's about to do. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 4. Let's hear this word from God, times and seasons. And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, you've got to understand, in the end of uh, the Gospels, Jesus has come to the disciples and breathed on them, and they have received the Holy Spirit already. This is not what that's talking about. He says, you shall be baptized. That's where the Holy Spirit comes upon us for service. You'll remember in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not given, but the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets, and they would prophesy. And so, as it is today in the church, the Holy Spirit comes up on, uh, up on us and enables us with His uh, gifts and His anointing to do what is supernaturally needed at the time. So this is what Jesus is introducing to the foundation of the church, which is the apostles that He's talking to here. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which are the Father has in his own authority. And a lot of people want to, when they're preaching, stop at verse 7. But there's a but there. And it's a conjunction in, chapter, in verse 8, is there not? He says, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has in his own power, but you shall receive what? power, authority, jurisdiction, when the Holy Spirit has come where? Upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God has all things up under his power, does he not? He's a sovereign God. He will let us know as his children when a season will end and when another one will begin. Our time is in His hands. Now, as I began talking about the sovereignty of God 
and how that he is in total control. Now, there is delegated authority that he has already given to man through Adam. And those who rebel against God are doing things that are unlawful and are perverse in God's sight. And although that is not the way God would have it to go, God is still in control of situations. And so you would might say, if God is in total control, then why are things going so awry and evil in, our la in these days as they are? It's because God is giving people time to repent and turn from the evil that they're doing, lest they perish in their sin. Now they have free will and they can do as they please. Anybody can do as they please, but if we have a God consciousness and you have a conviction of the Holy Spirit and you know the Word of God, you will not stray too far from God's Word. Now turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Let's get into this Word and see what the Holy Spirit's telling us today. Paul's writing to the believers there in Philippi, and we'll pick it up in verse 12. Therefore, my brethren, or my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So this is what we as Christians are supposed to do. We don't need someone looking over our shoulder to help us walk with Christ. We're to hold ourselves accountable and work out our own salvation knowing that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ as Christians give an account for the time that we spent here on earth knowing Him. For it is who? God who works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. Has God ever told you by His Spirit to do something and you just didn't want to do it so you didn't do it? And God wouldn't leave you alone. And he, he, just, he just wore on you day after day until finally you said, Okay, God, this misery of not doing it is far worse than having to do it. And you said, Okay, I'm going to do it now, but I'm not going to like doing it while I do it. But you did it anyway, right? So that is God working in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. He knows how to get His do will done in people's lives. Even if you have to go to prison for a while, He knows how to get your attention. Can I get a witness? Do all things that he tells you without complaining and disputing. Now, you thought the first part of that commandment was hard. Try doing it without murmuring and complaining and disputing. Eh. Why does he want us to do his will and then do it with a joyful heart? That you may become blameless, harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You'd think Paul just wrote this yesterday. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. So we've got to act different. We've got to speak different. We've got to do differently if the world is going to see a difference in us as Christians. Can I get a witness? Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain it seemed when our boys were younger if they were ever going to do something we wouldn't approve of it was whenever they were away from us outside belts reach <laughs> they still make those children come into the world needing instruction and correction you've got to program them because why they have, they're born with the sin nature you don't have to teach a child to do wrong. They do that automatically. They've got that down. You've got to teach them how to live right, how to live godly, how to live in peace and how to behave and not take their children, I mean their siblings out. I'm not talking to lunch either. Paul, Paul was commending the Christians in Philippi because they had learned how to obey God when the apostle was not around to direct or to correct them. Now, that's success in leadership in the body of Christ. When those that you pastor, those that you lead, are able to do what they're called to do without you being around to cause them to do it. Children, thank God, do not remain childish, and neither should believers. There comes a time when we got to grow up. Now, I want to place emphasis on who is 
who it is that saves us as Christians. It is God by His Spirit who drew us, who has convicted us, and ultimately brought us to salvation in Christ. It is God who designed and carried out the, both the plan of redemption of fallen man and the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was Jesus, the Son of God, who has paid the price for our sins, but He did this while we were yet sinners and while we were yet enemies of God, according to Romans chapter 5. From the moment that we are born again until the time we draw our final breath on this earth, it will be God who works in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. So you see now how much God really is in control. So what we don't need to do is rebel against God because that opens up the door to the enemy. And Paul tells us plainly in Ephesians, do not give place to the devil. You know, the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that produces repentance. Whenever your children are disobedient, when they're in total, full-blown rebellion, and you try to make them see the error of their ways, and you try to make them conform to what you want for their life, you will find that they will resist you even more. How many has ever tried it and found that for correction on a rebellious child sometimes will drive them even further away from you? But the Bible says it's not the fear of God that produces repentance. The fear of God keeps you from sin after repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And so... What we learn as our children grew up is when, when they start transitioning from children into adulthood, you've got to change your tactics, your M.O. on correcting and leading your children. Because once they get into a rebellious stage where they will not hear you and they begin hardening their heart against you, then you're only going to push them further away from you and, and bring a division in that relationship between you, can't, between you and them to where you can't even speak into their lives. And so I got to thinking about this. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. You know, you see the world the way it's getting right now, especially in America with all the perversion that even our leaders are endorsing. And you think, why don't God just come down here and, and take his belt off and, and correct them? Because all they will do is harden their heart and it will drive them further away from him. Have you noticed that God does not come off his throne. Don't make me come down there after you. He don't say that. What does he do? He says, all right. Matter of fact, Jesus gives us an example in the prodigal son, the, the parable of the prodigal. The father stayed home. He gave him the money knowing what he's going to do. He left. The father stayed home, carried on with his affairs, did what he's always done when his sons were at home and obeying him. Now his son is out there in a far country, uh, connected himself to a strange uh, person over there in that land of sin, in that land of prodigal living. Prodigal literally means to spend your money on uh, selfish uh, ambition, selfish uh, pleasures, and just throwing it away and throwing your life away. But once the prodigal came to his senses and he says, I, had, I have it better. Matter of fact, the servants have it better in my father's house than I do here where I'm at. He says, I will go back to my father and I'll tell my father I am no longer worthy to be a son. I'll be a servant. And it says when the father saw his son coming from afar off, he ran, fell on his neck and kissed him, killed the fatted calf and clothed him. And this is a picture of the Father's love. The Father will not hound people that are in rebellion and sin. He will convict them. He will lift his goodness off of them because they're in rebellion. And when, watch this, 
Father, give me my portion of inheritance. Right? That's what he said. That was all the goodness that he would have left remaining. Once that inheritance was spent on that righteous living, wasteful lifestyle, the goodness would be gone. And after the goodness is gone, the corn is eaten up, and the only thing left are husks. And he was willing to eat the husk that he was feeding the swine. And so what God does is he's not going to run after them and make them obey him. He's going to let them run out. And what they'll do is they'll come out from under his cover, come out from under his goodness, and you cannot sustain your life without God's goodness. And it's that, the goodness of God, that leads one back to repentance. I had it better where? In the Father's house. So all God has to do is just sit there. The goodness will come off when the rebellion goes on. And the, the goodness of God will pull them back. And whenever you don't hound somebody, I have uh, parents that... Tell, talk to me and says, how do I handle my child now that they have decided to go into homosexuality and they want to bring their partner over to the house? And I said, if you stand against them and you talk to them and, and you try to make them change when they're not willing, it's only going to drive them further into that lifestyle. So God shows us you're not condoning the sin, but you're not condemning the person. And what this does is it allows God time to work in their heart the goodness of God and they'll start missing that goodness. And that goodness will bring them back. Well, guess what? America has been a prodigal child now for decades. And God has not come down here with a bell and destroyed it like a lot of prophets said is going to happen. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Well, explain to me Nineveh. God gave them opportunity. And there is where the repentance came. God gave them a space to repent. And so God has to give America space to repent. And he's going to do it not through wrath. He's going to do it through his love and his goodness. And the America... You, you think, my God, how bad does bad have to get before politicians and, and Christians start saying, you know what, it's bad. It's getting bad, y'all. I read a report this week of how awful the stuff coming out of our southern border into America is. I want to give you one statistic. There has been enough fentanyl, which is used to cut drugs like heroin, there's been enough fentanyl come in in 2018 alone to kill every person in America. And youth are dying on fentanyl. Where is the goodness of God? We need the goodness of God back in America. And when the, the goodness of God comes back on America, we're going to start seeing things change. Matter of fact, we're going to start seeing people change. We're going to see their attitudes and their works and, and, and every, their, everything that they do change because the goodness of God leads us to change. Give Him praise. Isn't God good? God loves for us to know his heart. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's not hard-hearted. He's not out to kill you. He's not up there waiting for you to stumble and fall so he can bury you deep. He's there to pick you up, dust you off, and put your feet on a rock. Look there in John chapter 11, please. The story of Lazarus is in this chapter 
We'll pick it up in verse 1. I'm going to share a couple of highlights from it because it's lengthy. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and Martha, her sister. It was that Mary, Lazarus' sister, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Jesus heard that, or when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And you'll remember it was this miracle that sent Jesus to the cross. So literally what he is saying, he's prophesying his death. The Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus said to them, Are there not twelve? Drop down to verse uh, 20. I'll end up reading the whole story. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to the Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask God, of God, God will give you. We're told in this chapter that Jesus loved Lazarus, so much so that he cried outside Lazarus's tomb, even though he knew he was fixing to raise him from the dead. But Jesus chose to wait two more days after he received the news of Lazarus falling ill. When he arrives at the tomb of Lazarus, Martha chided Jesus because he waited until her brother had died. Now, I want you to think about that. I don't know how long it took him to get from Bethany to where, or to where Lazarus was from where he was. But obviously several days has passed because he was sick. He waited two days. By the time he gets there, Lazarus is not only sick no longer, he's dead, been dead for four days. So some time has elapsed, has it not? Yet he loves Lazarus so much, but yet he waited until he died. So if you tell me you love me, <laughs> does that mean you're going to wait till I'm dead till you come see me? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. If the Lord is the one who saves us and knows what is best for us, then he is the one who decides when he's going to show up in our situations and not us. That right there was worth the trip all the way from L.J. If he knows what's best for us and he's in control, then he knows when to show up in our situation, does he not? The sisters, is what the Bible called them, sent word from uh, that Lazarus got sick, but Jesus waits. This means that we can pray the very moment a trial hits our life. You start praying. God, we got bad news today. Get on Facebook. Everybody pray now. An urgent prayer. Pray, 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 pray in the Spirit. Pray however you want to. Pray. But the Lord will wait until His will is accomplished. In the trial before he shows up to deliver us from our troubles. You ever had somebody get in trouble and you went and you, you got them out of trouble? Because they called you and says, I'm in trouble, come and get me out. Nobody? Oh, a lot of hands. What happened? They got back in trouble. You should have waited at least six days. God delays, he teaches us, God delays his hour of visitation according to Hebrews 10. Why does God wait when we call on him? And why did he wait with uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha after they had sent word to him? That's like God in heaven. We send him a word. We got problems down here. Come quickly. So why does he have us 
wait after we've sent him flares up. Get down here quickly. Here's why. So that we will hold on in faith. That's it. You're going to hold on by faith until he gets there. Now, by causing us to wait after praying for deliverance, here's what's going on in us. It's stretching us. God, if you don't show up, I'm going to be stretched to my, I mean, I'm just like, I'm on edge. I might hurt somebody down here. Show up. Has anybody been stretched? Is anybody being stretched right now? We want breakthrough in the situation. But God wants His per will perfected in us. So who you think going to get their will? You or God? So you might as well make yourself comfortable in the fire. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. You know what was good for... Daniel, the lines were on the Daniel fast. <laughs> Daniel couldn't get out. Could Daniel get out? Who did he wait on? God. So what did God do while Daniel was waiting? He shut up the lion's mouth. The three Hebrew men were thrown into the fiery furnace. Did God deliver them out when they cried on God? No. He said, I'll show up in your fire, and when I show up, I'll be a witness to Nebuchadnezzar, and it will change his heart. The reason you're going through trials is not all so much about you. It's about what people are going to see when you're in the furnace praising God. God is going to work his will in us. And sometimes he'll use a furnace. We're almost out of time, and I want to encourage you. Be sure and check the time, the station that you're watching this program on so that you can catch the powerful conclusion of times and seasons. Lord, the Lord is absolutely speaking directly to where we're living in this day, giving us clear spiritual direction, both by the Holy Spirit, confirmed out of the Word of God, so that we know that God has not forsaken us, but He is literally ordering our steps through the times that we're living in. Everything is under God's power and authority. And as a result of this word, it will build faith and strengthen you in your walk with Christ. So thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to see the message in its entirety without interruption, you can contact our church office. Uh, the information is at the bottom of the screen. And let the uh, operator know the name of the sermon, times and seasons, so they can get it out to you quickly. As I get ready to leave you today, I always want to encourage you, send in your prayer request and your praise reports. Let's agree together for God to deliver you out of any trial, any affliction that you may be going through because God is for us, and if God be for us, who can be against us? Till this time next week, keep looking up because Christ's return is imminent. God bless you.